Hey folks, my name's Ed Trevers. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm an Anglican priest serving in the beautiful parish of St. Margaret of Scotland that sits on the ancestral and on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Gwe. So I had a client, I have a client, and um, a wonderful person, and they have a really interesting, they have a really interesting passion. And, and I stumbled across a, a quote from the Bhagavad Gita that's, that really, really speaks to their particular situation. And I, and I took this quote, and I'll read it to you in a second. I took this, this passage of the Bhagavad Gita, and I, and I put it on Facebook. Let me read you the quote before I go on any further. You have the right to work, but for the work's sake only. You have no right to the fruits of the work. Desire for the fruits of work must never be your motive in working. Never give away to laziness either. Perform every action with your heart fixed on the Supreme Lord. Renounce attachment to the fruits. Be even-tempered in success and failure. For it is this evenness of temper which is meant by yoga. Work done with anxiety about results is far inferior to work done without such anxiety. In the calm of surrender, seek refuge in the knowledge of Brahma. They who work selfishly for results are miserable. Now, I like this quote. It speaks to me. It speaks to me because of a lot of the things that I do. Oftentimes, I find myself trapped in a desire to achieve a particular result by the work that I do. And I can tell you that I do feel miserable. Now, that's on an emotional, psychological level. Uh, that's, on a, that's on a heart level, maybe even a spiritual level. But a friend of ours responded to it quite brilliantly. They said, many would say that this is just crazy. How does a person work 40 hours a week and not be able to be warm and fed? The concept is right and good. Just don't say this to many of those working three jobs to care for a family. I agree with the sentiment and the concept. Okay, that's a brilliant, that's a brilliant comment. I love it because what it does is it says, okay, wait a second. In this world though, we work for the results of a paycheck. How then can you say, I shouldn't be worried about a paycheck? I mean, a, 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 you know, a greedy employer. You know, a greedy, a greedy businessman might say, hey, you should be working just for the joy of working. You should be working, uh, you should be cleaning those toilets for the joy of cleaning toilets. You should be, you should be scraping the pits for the joy of scraping the pits. You should be doing the hardest, nastiest, stinkiest work you can imagine for the sheer joy of what it means to get dirty and nasty and stinky. And I shouldn't have to pay you all that much. And as a matter of fact, if you come to me saying you need to give me more and you need to pay me what I'm actually worth and you need to pay me a reasonable fair wage, I can say to you, you're being selfish according to this scripture. So here's the thing. What's the answer? What's the answer to that comment? <sighs> scripture doesn't always simply tell us how to live and and how to feel and how to think and how to behave it doesn't always just tell us the standards by which we should measure our own behavior sometimes scripture also without ever saying a word paints us a picture of the kind of world we're supposed to be creating i believe for example with with this passage from the bhagavad gita now, what it's saying is, in an ideal world, a world where everybody's needs are being taken care of, a world where nobody is cold and where nobody is hungry, when everybody has what they need to get by, when every family has what they need to, to raise healthy children and, and to live healthy lives, then you should be working for the sake of the work itself. But it paints us a picture of an ideal world. And, 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 and that world is something that we, as people of faith, are meant to be striving for. 
I want to create a world for you where you can live this way. I want to create a world for you when you can live according to your purpose, when you can live according to, to your passions, where you can do the work that you desire to do for the sake of the work itself, so that you, just simply so that you can be proud of a good, a good day's creation. I want that kind of world for you. I want that kind of world for me and for my family. And I think if you look at the Gospels, I think if you look at Jesus' teachings, in particular, I think if you look at Jesus' teachings, he teaches us a lot of, he tells us a lot of things that we're supposed to be striving for, a lot of things that are supposed to be, that we're supposed to be able to do. You know, one that comes to mind is we should love our enemies and bless those who hate us. We've talked about that. We've talked about forgiveness on this channel many, many, many times. And, and, and we often, I, I, will, I will have an email or a comment made saying, how can you expect me? How can you expect me to, to be in relationship with someone who has abused me or harmed me or hurt me? How do you expect me to forgive the unforgivable? How do you expect me to, to be able to, to, to be in the same room as someone who did something horrible to me or to mine? Jesus tells us, he tells the rich young man, right? The guy comes and says, hey, what must I do to follow you? And Jesus tells him a few things. He tells him a parable. And then he says, when the guy goes, well, I've done this my whole life. Jesus says, great, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. So how is it that I'm supposed to sell everything I have to give it to the poor if I'm going to follow Jesus? Right When Jesus tells us to give and to give and to give, to, to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of strangers, to love one another as he loved us, well, that's all fine and good. H how am I supposed to live the way Jesus lived where he says, I don't have a bed, I don't have a roof over my head. Right? The birds, the flowers, the, the animals, they don't worry about things. They just believe that God is going to take care of them. They just go about life. Well, how am I supposed to live that way, Jesus? Well, part of the answer to that, part of the answer to that is that what Jesus is doing is he's, he's also at the exact same time telling us, painting a picture the kind of world we're supposed to live in, the kind of world we're supposed to be striving to create. I, I can sacrifice for the strangers in a world where, where I'm taken care of, where I know I'm taken care of. I can, I can live like the birds and the flowers. I can live like Jesus with, no bed to lay down in and no roof over my head when, when I know I'm being taken care of. I, I can let go of my, my physical, material attachments in a world where I'm not afraid to starve to death, in a world where, where I'm not afraid to go cold, that I will be cold. So sometimes when we read these, when we read these, passage of, of scripture, wherever this scripture may come from, the author, the source may not simply be telling us, this is how I expect you to live, or this is, this is how I want you to live. Sometimes they're also offering us an image of the world we are striving. We are supposed to be striving to create. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face be made to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord's countenance be lifted up to you. May you always know the peace of being in the Lord's presence. When we encounter these kinds of scriptures and they challenge us in the way that they do, I pray. I pray we will see not only the action they are calling us to, but that we will also see a world that you and I are asked to build for ourselves and for the generations to come. And I pray that we will be bold enough and courageous enough and wise enough
to build that world. Amen. Namultus.